Welcome to Season 2 of On Listening. This is your host, Daniel Rosen. Thank you for joining us as we continue to explore listening in all its dimensions. Continue listening after the interview is over for some information about engagement with the show. Thank you. On the next episode, this episode of On Listening, we have my friend and colleague, David Prescott, who I believe is a social worker, as am I, and he's the editor of Safer Society Press, an international trainer and independent consultant. Thank you for coming on, David. All right. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. Did I get that right? You sure did. Clinical social worker. Yes. Fantastic. And a, a quick bit on what is the Safer Society Press? Ooh, the Safer Society Press is um, one half of the Safer Society Foundation. Safer Society is a nonprofit that um, whose vision is to use preventive and restorative approaches to sexual and social violence. Um, it was founded in the mid 1980s uh, by an extraordinary woman named Faye Honey Knopp, and her deal was that she was a Quaker. Uh, who believed that if we were to ever truly um, solve the issues around sexual abuse, that we needed to understand the people who were doing the abusing. And so she went into prisons and interviewed uh, people convicted of sex crimes. And this was happening at a time when a lot of psychological practice had to do with either trying to measure sexual arousal patterns or use uh, various kinds of counseling techniques uh, to get these men to behave themselves. But uh, so um, on par with the theme of your uh, series, um, she was actually going in and simply listening and then writing books with titles like When Your Wife Says No uh, and things like this. An amazing person, and I'm really, really honored to be working in her uh, um, or sort of following in her footsteps. Well, that's wonderful. It sounds like uh, it is, I know, it's an important uh, contribution to the world of trying to make the world a safer place. And uh, I know you're involved in a number of other organizations. So you are all over the place uh, trying to make the world a better place, in particular focusing on people who have done the things that are harming others. I think that's a part of why I wanted you on the show. I'm, I have this idea in my mind that the world thinks that listening is sort of universally a great idea. And sometimes I've wondered if listening doesn't sometimes do harm to us. So maybe we'll get into that today. Hmm. Maybe not. But I'm curious about how I also, well, I also wanted you on because I've done webinars with you and I found you to be a very good listener. So to put you right on the spot, tell me what your thoughts are about listening. Wow. Um, well, thanks for asking. Where to start? You know, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start with my father. Uh, my father was a great guy. The name was Peter Prescott, and he reviewed um, books. There, there's a job that no longer exists, a professional book reviewer. He reviewed books for Newsweek magazine way back um, in the day. And my father grew up with a speech impediment. Um, he stuttered. And um, one of the things that he told me that I've never forgotten was he said, you know, David, one of the reasons I'm such a great interviewer is because of my speech problem. And I learned early on that if I could just shut up and listen, um, that the people I was interviewing would damn themselves. (laughs) And so (laughs) I'm a therapist. He was a journalist. So he was he was looking for, you know, where are people's inconsistencies and what can he uh, do to, um, you know, he was an investigative journalist. Uh, So he knew a lot about listening and I guess uh, raised me in that kind of a climate. He also listened to a lot of music and sat me down when I was about three years old, along with my mother. How's this for parenting? They they sat me down in front of the stereo. You remember with enormous speakers and all of this kind of stuff. And they played me Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata and said, we're playing this for you. We want to know if you like it. And that set the tone for decades of music production and listening and, and stuff like that. So I guess, you know, some of us are born with a great set of eyes. Some of us are born with a great set of ears. Um, uh, and I'm closer to ears than eyes. Uh, and then, it, it, um, frankly, entering into the world of social work and, and growing up in the 1970s, 
Um, it's it occurred to me first implicitly and nowadays quite explicitly how little people actually listen to one another. And all you have to do now is look at the headlines, but that's probably not a good direction to go in. Well, that's that's really interesting because uh, some of the other guests I interviewed talked about how um, they were raised in environments where there wasn't a lot of listening modeled. And so it's wonderful to hear that, yes, people were raised in environments where listening was cherished and uh, valued to such a high extent. Um, but it's still a skill, right? Even though you, you talked about it sort of innately, you you implied that uh, you were sort of born a good listener. But to some extent, you were crediting your parents for cultivating that in you? See, that's where I'm not sure I agree, Dan. Because I'm not sure uh, it was nice of you to call me a good listener. And honestly, I'm not sure that I am. And your question got me to thinking that I probably listen differently than than uh, than other people do. And, yeah, it was it was um, it was valued highly in in my house. But as recently as last week, I, I just interviewed our mutual friend, Scott Miller, um, in a uh, in a webinar conversation. And he um, he said something where he was he said, well, as I said just a few moments ago, blah, de, blah, de, blah. <laughs> and I found myself thinking, oh, gosh, did I somehow miss that? And and I think if I missed it, it's because a lot of times I don't know if you do this as well or I tend to listen as much to the tone um, or the uh, the sort of the rate, the pitch, the volume. I listen to how people talk maybe as much or more than I listen to what they say. So when I'm doing, for example, assessments on how dangerous somebody might be or how risky they are in this direction or that direction, I really need to be on my game to make sure that I'm pursuing the just the facts, ma'am, strategy and, and you know, getting the details of what, are, what somebody's saying. But I think what makes me um, you know, better in a therapy situation can be because I'm really listening to the tone and the underlying, I don't know what the right word is, gestalt or, or whatever. Yeah. So I actually suck at listening in a lot of ways, and I'm just going to be honest um, about that. Am I answering your question? You are. You're answering it and reflecting on uh, your experiences listening as opposed to talking about what you've been taught or uh, oh, yeah. trying, to, trying to teach, which I, I'm appreciating. That is sort of the goal of this is to have a process where we're talking what the process is about the thing we're doing. Uh, God, I have a lot of reflections on that. Well, Scott, yes, I interviewed Scott, and he talked about, uh, uh, I loved his phrase, jazzed up listening, and that in in a podcast, we're kind of riffing off each other a little bit and uh, going with associations, contrasting that with a more clinical kind of listening where you're trying to not listen to the story in your head and really tune into what the other person is saying. Uh, that's one reflection on it. and And I found that, uh, there's a limited, like even though our listening and thinking is much faster than our speech production and auditory huh. input, um, the listening to my own associations and noticing body language, which we're spared right now, we're not looking at each other, which makes this easier to focus on our words, uh, can be overwhelming. You can't kind of do it all at once. And so something might fall off the wayside, including content from the other person. Yeah, very true. Very true. And Actually, as you were saying that, I was thinking about uh, uh, doing therapy practice in the in the COVID era. Um, so many of us talking on the phone are now able to tune in on various elements of a conversation that we would have missed uh, before. Um, you know, before I, I think you were um, drinking a cup of tea or something like this, I could hear you uh, getting ready uh, for all of this or um, being able to hear somebody else's breath or, or whatnot is very different from when you're trying to listen to somebody in a group therapy room, for example, of the, the kind that takes place in a prison cell, which sometimes happens, or um, other situations like talking to your partner from across the kitchen or or, or whatever else. There's so many different ways to listen in so many different contexts. When I was interviewing Scott last week, he also had the very good habit of looking straight into the camera, which meant I perceived him as looking straight at me. So there was a, a lot of um, sort of sensory input that was very powerful visually that maybe you wouldn't have gotten because you were talking to him on the phone. 
And uh, with the end result, I, it, it made it easier for me to miss some of the content of what he was saying. Oh, and then, of course, there's the fact that he says X, Y, and Z, and I'm really interested, and I'm now waiting uh, for him to finish his comment on that, um, which uh, so that I can ask him about X, Y, and Z. Tell me more about X, Y, and Z. But in the moment when I'm holding on to that, don't forget to ask him about X and Y and Z, in that very moment, it makes it easier for me not to hear something else that he is saying because I'm so focused on how I'm going to respond or what my next question is going to be. Listening is not for the faint of heart, is it? Good. So we just had a technological glitch. My uh, voice is going to be less mellifluous from a different uh, speaker that crumped out on me. But listening is not for the faint of heart. And I, this is what I do. I'm listening. You know, the show is a little recursive. We're talking about listening as we're listening and trying to remember things. And it is. It's very hard to know what to privilege, what to pay attention to. Um, maybe when I say you're a good listener, David, I like uh, – that there's certain things you listen to, like you listen for certain things, you pick up on particular things, because the there's no perfect listener. Nobody's like a, a Google AI that catches every single piece of information. We have to prioritize which parts we like. That's very true. And then there's kind of the context um, in which so much listening occurs. I'm, I'm thinking, Dan, that uh, one of the first times we had a, uh, a longer conversation, um, I was listening to you with an attitude of um, this guy wants to be a better therapist and he's asking questions about um, something, a, a topic where I'm, uh, I'm a little bit further down the road than he is. And, you know, there's lots of ways that you're further on down the road um, than me in, in some topic areas, but this was, uh, you know, an area that I uh, know something about. And so I was, I was listening to you f with an attitude of, um, this is a fellow professional fellow human being, somebody uh, with lots of things to offer, I want to listen to what it is that he's uh, either ambivalent about or struggling with or, or wants to know to see what else I can learn um, along the way. And that might be very different from, for example, the way we listen to our, uh, to our partners. And uh, something that I think about a lot when I think about listening is um, how differently we align ourselves uh, with the various people um, in our lives. So, for example, I've been married for 25 years. Every day is better than the day that uh, came before it, etc. All of that. And I end up listening to my wife and she ends up listening to me very differently than we would um, with others. Um, I think not just because we're in tune with each other, but also we've learned some kinds of response styles uh, that are going to be useful or helpful. Well, if I could, maybe I'll just give you an example. When I'm fun uh, functioning as a therapist, there's some things I'm simply not going to do. And um, so I'm, I'm not going to be overly brusque um, or to the point, um, but I'm, I'm going to try to be compassionate uh, at all times, empathic, compassionate, all that stuff that, you know, um, a good therapist does. So uh, Fred Rogers and me, you know, we're like this when it comes to therapy. OK, so um, so along comes my wife and uh, again, 25 years of marriage. And she says, David, I'm upset about this and that and the other thing, and I don't, I'm not sure what I'm going to do about about that. And um, I can see that she's getting upset and in a, using a different definition of compassion or a different um, application of compassion, knowing the limits of our relationship, I might be more direct. So I'm just remembering yeah. some specific times where she would come and say, I'm thinking about that. And I can say something like, um, Louise, I think you're overthinking this. And her response back 100% of the time will be, yeah, you're right. Whereas if I said that to a client, I could uh, never get away with it. Uh, well, I might, but I wouldn't get away with it for long. And sooner or later, somebody would take very great exception to it. 
And in that moment, it, the message back to Louise, my wife, would be, um, I've been listening to her. And she would know that she's been listened to by her husband. And she would understand it that way. But if I say, I think you should just, I think you're overthinking this to a client. Oh, man. The first place they would probably go would be, you're not listening to me. So yeah, it's yeah. it's amazing these relational components that uh, that take place along the way. What the do you think? Came to my, yeah, the word yeah. that came to my mind is a taxonomy that uh, oh, like a taxonomy of listening. Scott talked about jazzed up. Uh, Steve Benjamin, I interviewed. We talk about how our therapist brain hijacks us when we're talking with friends and family. Mm. Um, there's there's listening that is designed like your father would do. He's going to listen in a way to. Uh, be an adversary of the people he's interviewing so that he can get them to uh, spill the, the gooey stuff that they're trying not to spill. Uh, and so it, uh, it's a taxonomy, it's a fancy word, but there's all these different contextual ways. We listen under these circumstances or different kinds of listening under the same circumstance for a different purpose. Um, it, the, word, the word is very limiting. Yeah, yeah. I guess I had never thought of it as a kind of taxonomy of listening, but you're you're absolutely right. And then that leads us to how does listening get so badly misplaced, misapplied, misunderstood that, uh, again, I'm sorry to bring it up, but it is yet another election year. And it seems as though uh, nobody's listening to each other. And uh, at the risk of being too personal, I'm, I'm not sure anybody is listening to the voters. And uh, it, it's always just remarkable um, how we manage to, uh, to miss the boat. Well, I, I, I'll try not to be timid and step into that. And hopefully <laughs> Twitter, a Twitter horde won't be unleashed upon us. But uh, so just for the, well, this is uh, May 18th, 2020. It is the COVID pandemic, and it is an election year, uh, United States presidential election. And there's a lot of talk of how uh, sides are listening. So I have, I mean, I'm sure you have some opining and uh, actual thoughts about that, but uh, it seems that listening, truly listening to someone is an act of vulnerability. You, you have to, in order to really listen, you have to be open to the world that they're trying to tell you about. And if you're not open, for any variety of reasons, then you can maybe mirror or reflect back or uh, discredit what someone has said to you. But there's a deeper level of listening that it, uh, uh, almost by necessity has the potential to change you. And I think people are guarded against that. Yeah, I'm not sure quite where to, to start with that. The element of vulnerability the um, the capability or capacity or the um, not invitation not capacity, the possibility of entering into somebody else's world. Dan, as you were talking, I, I get one of the places I went through in my own mind was almost the power dynamics of uh, of listening, of of sharing, and um, I work in a field you know in a, in abuse prevention where listening almost is a, um, a kind of political or it has political implications. I'm not talking elections. I'm talking about um, the, uh, you know, who we are in the lives of, of other people. And there is a kind of irony to me at times that to truly listen to people who have uh, committed crimes or done things uh, that uh, that we don't approve of or that they don't approve of um, requires us uh, on one hand it really requires us to take a one down position to be yeah. able to say i'm willing to learn from you and on the other hand the judgments that we often have about their behaviors cause us to take a one up position. So it's almost as though we're willing to listen, but only on our terms. And to truly listen to somebody else means we need to zip it and listen to them on their terms. How many times have we heard this in a, in a marital quarrel? 
Um, it really hurt me, hurt me uh, when you said X. And the response back is, yeah, well, it really hurts me when you say Y. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> right. I've heard that referred to as what aboutism. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you, you, ju you jump from uh, talking about people who have committed sex crimes or alleged to have committed sex crimes to marital, but I got my head was stuck in the first part sure. of the dynamic there. And maybe that's maybe the you know you know you talk about the political climate and how people aren't listening to each other and I'm saying well there's a vulnerability that's required so I experienced this I've worked with people I ran a program for people who have uh, been convicted uh, there wasn't there was an allegation they been convicted and I found sometimes it was hard to really listen I I, I almost didn't want to crawl that far in the person's head and hear everything from their side because. Uh, the last thing you can do when you're running a program like that is be convinced that uh, that person's perspective is entirely correct, uh, uh, that they didn't do it, or that they're a victim, or they were set up, or the system stacked against them. Um, so I had the war in my head, and I could feel the, the pull in sometimes. Yeah, boy, it's... I, that is... Uh, that's certainly a topic that we talk a lot about in introductory trainings in our field. And all too often, it seems as though, I mean, yeah, you and I have both listened to many conversations where people were either trying to defend themselves, deflect responsibility away from themselves, um, somehow place them in the most favorable, place themselves in the most favorable light and, uh, um, and what have you. And sooner or later, that becomes a real challenge, and judgment jumps in at, you know, around the, the periphery of these conversations, and it's hard not to have some kind of response, judging them either as, this guy really isn't so bad, or taking a more defensive um, one-upsmanship posture and saying, this guy is lying and manipulating. And sometimes it's as simple as um, this person uh, is not telling the full truth because we all grew up learning that when mom says, who left the milk out, um, the <laughs> only appropriate answer was not me. And yet that, li that act of listening over time can have a pretty profound uh, um, effect both on that particular interaction and I would say also who we are and how we operate within the world. That's a really important observation you're making, Dan. It was, uh, I felt there was a risk sometimes of listening too carefully. Um, what kind of risk? Well, that, uh, well, as I said, that I'd be uh, sort of lose my professional uh, role or that I would be uh, uh, vulnerable to feeling influenced to do something that I felt uh, at the moment before listening deeply, I shouldn't agree with, which is, I think, yeah. what's happening in the political climate. We, people are, uh, uh, the progressives tend to think that people who follow Donald Trump are actively blocking or calling things fake news and actively engaged in a not listening. And uh, But that group would make the same allegation against the progressives that they're uh, actively not listening to um, their stories. Maybe that's different from the clinical room, but uh, it seems there's some similarity of, I just don't want something to be true, so I won't listen. Yeah, sure. And if this were on video, we could have sort of a Venn diagram of where these things overlap in the um, in the various worlds and our thought patterns and and everything else that uh, that go along with it. I will say, in my professional work, sometimes I've found myself listening deeply, trying to align with the client, and I'm listening with the goal not only of understanding, but making sure that we have clear what are this person's goals. Where do I fit into this person's life? What is my exact role in their life? And what kind of an approach is going to work best with this person? And then I get the chance to go back and either think about it, or I write down some notes from that session, 
or um, ideally, whenever it's possible, I get to talk to somebody else um, about the interview that I've had. And that's when uh, some degree of reflection on that listening experience um, helps me regain some kind of balance saying, you know, I, I, now that I'm done listening and I'm comparing this guy, for example, to scientific data or, um, you know, I'm going over his scores on some test or whatever, putting it into a slightly new uh, context for me where I can arrive at some kind of an assessment, not a judgment, but an assessment of who this person is, how he came to do what he did, um, what is going to help him, you know, stay uh, out of prison or what have you. And, uh, and that sort of thing. So I guess sometimes listening isn't really over until it's truly over and you've had a chance to reflect, perhaps. Yes, yeah, Scott. Well, I can tell your colleagues, and Scott, uh, yes, he talked about that, uh, oh. that uh, listening has a, if I were to construct a grid of taxonomy in my mind, of there's different kinds of listening. And then there's the sort of mulling over and going over, reflecting on it, either sharing with a friend or a colleague or reviewing notes. Um, there's a segment, you know, there's echoes of listening that uh, help us discern the most important parts of it um, or the parts that we might have missed later down the road. So there's an immediate listening we're doing, and then there's a reflective listening, which I hope doesn't uh, cause us to wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh, damn, I said that on that podcast. Oh. <laughs> which is a, I'm very familiar with that kind of listening. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely. And Dan, you must have heard um, about uh, uh, my friend in the UK um, who, when she asked, what am I missing? You know, what um, what about my approach isn't uh, isn't a great fit for you? Um, he said something about it's the face that you make when you're listening. And she's a friend of mine. So I've actually had her make that face during Skype calls. And um uh, and the reason she's able to make the face is because once she got this feedback, she then said to the guy, imitate that face. Let me make that face. Tell me when I've got it so that she could understand um, from muscle memory when she was making that face. But then she went back and practiced it in the mirror and also practiced making uh, more helpful expressions on her face. I talk about taking feedback seriously. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, when is the last time any of us have looked in the metaphorical mirror in terms of what we're like when we are listening to figure out how we can do it better? So well, that, yeah. was a that was sarcasm. He said, when was the last time, as yeah. in most of us don't, uh, using sort of the royal you, but sure. uh, not to sound defensive, but that's what I'm doing right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to take a look at how I listen. Yes. And uh, getting yes. constructive feedback about how it goes over with my guests. Um, so I'll reflect. I'm going to yeah. I'm going to take that uh, transition to reflect on a thing that I'm doing. Uh, so listening, what I've read and as I've interviewed people, is not just the passive act of listening and uh, maybe, as your dad said, letting them trip over their own words. But we have to um, ask uh, questions. We have to gesture or uh, make explicit in some way that we want them to follow a particular train of thought or another train of thought. And I've been noticing that I tend to use laughter that way. And I'll find things funny, but I think that I laugh in a way that kind of uh, tries to put like a punctuation mark or an asterisk, like, oh yeah, that was, uh, I appreciate that. And and there might be, and I, and I do think that uh, that tech, that thing that feels natural to me sometimes comes across as scoffing or dis dispowering what the person's saying, where I'm actually appreciating it in the laugh. Yeah. <sighs> Who would have ever imagined it could get so complicated? I totally resonate with that because I try to use humor wherever I possibly can, and I'm prone to a little bit of laughter, and there's always the question, how do we laugh or use humor in a way that isn't going to end up insulting somebody somehow? And um, I learned, uh, especially th this changes around the, the country, like humor is just different in the Midwest than it is in the Northeast, for example. And uh, so I got some pretty strong negative feedback about my sense of humor and laughter when I lived out in the Midwest. And uh, and it, it's it's 
too bad because I always have viewed laughter and a little bit of humor, the way you just described it, as almost creating a, a, a bigger and safer space for the more difficult conversations that uh, the therapy or that, um, you know, really close friends um, have or what therapy yes. entails. Yeah. Yes, that's right. It's a manner of upbringing and uh, I have some roots in New York City and their sarcasm also uh, <laughs> and bombasticness has a sort of bring people in and that uh, I, that's oh I can't tell you how many times that's stung me um, uh, either either I was sarcastic because I was uh, 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 unconsciously expressing hostility or I was using sarcasm in a way to join and then it was uh, interpreted as a distancing move and it's uh, unwinding my personality would be figuring out all the various components of that. Um, yeah. With well, a response was, was that intended to be helpful? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Some, oh. That's right. Well, people do, do people that, you know, are people going to tell you, or are they going to, uh, are they going to listen and then point you towards what you just said and ask, what did you really mean by that? I mean, that's the skill of listening to say, uh, actually I heard, did I hear that the right way? Um, but I think sarcasm is a great example of something that we would, uh, is, rarely uh, successful clinically, but can be quite yeah. successful in non-clinical uh, non situations. Yeah. Yeah, very true. So what about the, uh, <clears throat> so listen, we talked about listening and uh, getting better at it in different ways we listen. And you talk, you know, you reference this nice kind of listening you and your spouse have. What about, do you think listening gets us in trouble? Uh, do you think that there's a, a dark side to it? Um, is it harmful yeah. for people to be good listeners sometimes? Yeah, um, the dark side of listening. When you when you said that, um, setting aside my 1970s roots and thinking, why well, is that like the dark side of the moon or uh, <laughs> uh, or whatever? Um, yeah, the dark side of listening. If there is one, it's funny because it's just been discussed for the first time uh, within the motivational interviewing network of trainers. Uh, it doesn't. It's not something that gets a lot of play, but it has to do also with the dark side of empathy. So, yes. Yeah. And the, so we listen and we listen with an open heart. We listen with an open mind. Um, you know, most of us use the word mindset, uh, developing a mindset of listening. Bill Miller, who who um, is basically the, the progenitor of motivational interviewing, also refers to the heart set of listening. So we do all of this and we, um, we listen with full knowledge that it's an honor to be able to hear somebody else's story and, and so on and so forth. It just always reminds me that um, if listening presents with a kind of vulnerability, so does talking. And that um, sometimes the most sadistic people uh, in the world are those that completely understand the internal mindset of the person that they're trying to hurt. Just as um, the most, oh, now I don't hunt, but uh, I imagine that the most effective hunters are those that understand the internal mindset um, of their prey. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I actually was just hiking in the woods yesterday and uh, I came upon a hunter's um, uh, deer stand. You know how it is. You climb up into a tree or whatever. And this person had actually created something so elaborate. I could walk up it and I took some pictures and, uh, and, and things like that. But you could see the way it was angled. He had a perfect angle on the ridge line where all of the deer would be walking. The thing I know about deer hunting is um, deer apparently in deer season like to walk along ridges. So he's figuring out, huh, they like to walk along ridges. I know this about deer. So I'm going to position myself where I can see the whole um, ridge line. And that way I'll be better to, uh, able to take them out when they, when they come along. And I understand I'm, I'm not representing deer hunters very well here. And, and, you know, I don't ultimately have that much of an opinion about it. But, um, but there's a good example of understanding somebody's internal uh, motivation and mindset and heart set and, and the way they view the universe um, against them. So I do kind of wonder about that. And then actually, Dan, um, then that presents with a challenge 
in terms of how we do listen, the dark side of listening to people who've been severely traumatized um, can be that they're not used to somebody showing that much of an interest mm. or that people who have shown that much of an interest used them to hurt them, used it to hurt them so that then the, the challenge becomes how do you, um, you know, how do you listen long and listen deeply in a way that doesn't end up unwittingly presenting a threat and well so actually so you if you if you, yeah. if you it sound like you're such a good listener as someone who offended against them um they they've they think there's an inherent risk in being in the presence of someone who's a great listener so they might be more on guard worried about you is that yeah um uh, yes. Either as a result of some kind of um, the last person who knew me, uh, who listened to me like this and understood where I was coming from, then gaslighted me. Um, yes. Or it could be as um, and here comes a little trigger warning. It could be um, as graphic as the person who abused the person you are now listening to. The abusive person in this person's life could recognize when they were experiencing distress and then take action to make it make their actions even more distressing to the client that or to the to the person that is the heart and soul, if you will, of sadism uh, right there. And that kind of stuff does happen. I guess if there is one remedy that I have to the dark side of listening, um, it's, and this might be the weirdest thing I say all day, it has something to do with physical alignment. And here's what I mean by this, which is um, we can both agree that, that the world's best hunters aren't up there trying to act like a deer when they might think like a deer, but they're not acting like a deer when they're hunting. And that the most effective therapists are not, um, uh, they're not trying to align with the people that they're, that they're hurting. Rather, they're trying to develop some degree of understanding and sort of dark side of empathy and then use it against them. What seems to make a big difference, at least in my experience, is in the moment when I'm talking to somebody that's been really hurt, I try to stay physically grounded in my own um, uh, sense of myself. I'm aware of my breathing. I'm aware of my heartbeat. I'm aware of what's happening inside my own body. And I'm listening with very great interest. And that seems to be the difference. So that now the listening is something I'm doing with instead with somebody and for somebody uh, instead of to somebody on them or with the intention of ultimately causing them harm. So uh, I'm borrowing, I just have to say, I'm borrowing some of those words directly from Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick, but uh, I just give credit where it's due. But that's, uh, that's kind of how I'm thinking, thinking about it. What do, you, what do you think, Dan? What am I missing? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about what you're missing, but uh, up there I'm automatically using uh, laughter to, to support what you're saying. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm missing. I'm noticed, so uh, I, I'm hearing some... Uh, some of what you're saying is harmonizing uh, what I talked about with other guests. My friend Steve Benjamin had referenced, uh, uh, had read uh, Against Empathy, I think is the name Oh, yeah, of the book. sure. Um, and I had, a, so you were talking and I started to think about uh, people I know where there's a, what we call interpersonal violence, where there's a, a controlling spouse in a, in a relationship and how, uh, distressing it can seem when um, it looks like a person is listening to a controlling uh, person in the relationship and now I'm really going to wonder are they even listening or are they just are people listening in a way that's harmful to them like the guy says usually a guy says, uh, I didn't mean it, or it'll never happen again, or I'm sorry. And uh, we suspect that's a tactic to control somebody. Um, I'm really speculating here, but I wonder, is there mm. a, a, 
it's, it feels a little dangerous to talk about it a little bit because I'm, I'm not implying in any way that anybody's asking for it. Um, but are they potentially listening in a way that's not healthy? Or is that not even listening? That's just being uh, conditioned and controlled. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, English living language words subject to change depending in areas. As you were talking, Dan, I went straight to the movie um, Sleeping with the Enemy. Remember that with the extremely... I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't. Oh, you didn't? Oh, and, and it's absolutely worth a seeing, uh, worth a, worth seeing as a kind of anchor point for what does a truly, truly bad husband and and uh, sadistic man look like and um through in within the movie i think he at first seems to listen he's charming uh, he sets it up as if he is listening with a goal of um uh, being in a relationship and uh you know being a loving doting partner to julia roberts etc and the next thing you know he's um a highly um, abusive and controlling and she needs to escape to some uh, midwestern village in order to um uh, uh to get away from him so is sort of everybody's worst nightmare relationship. It's not quite, it's sort of fatal attraction, but um, with gender reversal. And uh, and so, uh, so there is that sort of thing, that kind of dark side of listening when somebody's hidden agenda, you know, comes out over a long period of time. Um, I also think that that tends to be pretty rare. The, the, at least, maybe I misunderstood, but the hearts and flowers guy that you were just describing, who um, he does something wrong in a relationship and says, please let me make it up to you and everything else. Yeah. Very often, we th that might also just be a lost soul without a lot of social skills. I don't mean this in a negative way. I'm just sort of using my own little taxonomy, yeah, yeah. I guess, um, where this is a person that doesn't have the skills uh, to really Yeah, no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's uh, not, I'm, I'm not, yeah. Okay. I, I, no, I'm talking about someone who, uh, uh, if someone is tactically trying to control their partner yeah. and they respond to what that person says, yeah. we call that listening. Is that fair to even say there, you know, if a woman who has been harmed, uh, engages in a conversation that she promised herself I won't engage in it because I know that it's going to come and I'm going to get harmed at the end of it. Uh, is that even listening? Yeah, it's a good question. For me, I mean, you know, English major roots, I'm like, yep, it's listening and the agenda was hidden um, and completely I contrary. Like yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's helpful. I like that because I've really been well, struggling thanks. with this. Uh, you know, the, 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 the worst error would be to, you know, to blame somebody for uh, trying to listen to their partner. But when there's these covert agendas that yeah. uh, um, there's <sighs> not much, there's very little to do in a way. Yeah. You know, Dan, you just said something that really hit me. Um, the covert agenda. How many covert agendas are there? in the world at any one time. I, I remember a guy that was a great listener and he was trying to sell me, you know, a full size oh, yeah. pickup truck that I didn't need. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I remember a dentist who I swear was using personal, uh, perfect motivational interviewing. This guy used reflective listening like nothing I've ever seen. And his agenda was simply to get through the uh, dental session and, you know, have me pay my bill. I was a nice guy, but uh, he wasn't listening with a goal of deep understanding. And uh, so a, a different agenda there. And then, of course, how many times, going back to your point originally, have people listened to a date um, in, with the hope that they would eventually end up in bed with them um, over time? There's so many motivations for listening and so yes. many covert agendas um, along the way that really it does bring us back to where we started, which is, and who are we in the moment when we're listening? Are we connected yes. to ourselves? Are we really saying this is a human being with hopes, dreams, aspirations, and flaws, just like me? This is another human whose story I get to bear witness to and um, and keep ourselves grounded that way. Making sense? Oh, boy. So for the audience there, you know you're speaking to a master tactician You know you're, in a good way. You know you're speaking to a, a true professional listener who help, who helps you wrap the show. That oh, is, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That that was uh, right on target, perfectly timed on the on the on the clock, and 
really does something, you know, really, you know, in, in, you're, the way you close that on a positive note uh, really does show how you embody a lot of what you, uh, uh, you're working with me. We have a common agenda where people are trying to, to uh, do something and you, that was helpful. Was really Thank you, helpful. Dan. Thank you. And that concludes another episode from season two of On Listening. Thank you for joining us. Please check out our webpage on listening.net and subscribe. Please leave reviews on your favorite podcasting site. It helps me make a name for this. I don't have corporate sponsorship and all my guests are providing their time free. So there's no way to advertise this program other than word of mouth and your ratings. Email me comments or questions, dan at onlistening.net. Thank you so much for joining again. Take care. Mm-hmm.